Welcome everyone to our 21st annual uh, Supreme Court Review at the Anti-Defamation League and National Constitution Center. I'm Karen Levitt, UDL's National Civil Rights Council. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, before we get to the program, I do wanna say that we're all thinking of Justice Ginsburg's health and are wishing her a full and speedy recovery. We're grateful to be able to continue the program virtually this year in the time of COVID-19. For those of you joining us for the first time who may not be familiar with ADL's work, ADL was founded in 1913 with the mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. In keeping with our work on a broad range of civil rights issues, ADL has filed amicus briefs before the Supreme Court in many of the key cases that you will be hearing about today, including DACA, religion and government, and Title VII employment discrimination. Links to those briefs are included in the materials for this program, which you can access from ADL's website or through the National Constitution Center. And you can find bios of our distinguished presenters there as well. Well, let me introduce them now. Erwin Chemerinsky is the current Dean of Berkeley Law. He's authored 12 books, more than 200 law review articles, and numerous op-eds in newspapers across the country. He frequently argues appellate cases, including in the US Supreme Court, and in 2017, National Jurist again named him as the most influential in person in legal education in the United States. Paul Clement is a partner at Kirkland and Ellis LLP. Paul served as the 43rd Solicitor General of the United States under President George W. Bush. He has argued over 100 cases before the United States Supreme Court. Paul is a distinguished lecturer in law at the Georgetown University Law Center and a distinguished lecturer in government at Georgetown University. Frederick M. Lawrence is the 10th secretary and CEO of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. Fred is also a distinguished lecturer at the Georgetown Law Center and has previously served as president of Brandeis University, dean of the George Washington University Law School, and visiting professor and senior research scholar at Yale Law School. He is the author of Punishing Hate, Bias Crimes Under American Law, a book examining bias motivated violence and how such violence is punished in the United States. And last but definitely not least, Dahlia Lithwick is a senior editor at Slate, where she writes the Supreme Court dispatches and jurisprudence columns and hosts the amazing podcast Amicus. Don't miss the interview she just put out with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Washington Post, and commentary. She has been twice awarded an online journalism award for her legal commentary and was the first online journalist invited to the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press. Erwin Chemerinsky, Paul Clement, Fred Lawrence, and Dahlia Lithwick, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, let's start with an overview. Erwin, this term has seen a lot of disruptions, but also numerous major decisions. What are the major takeaways and themes from this year? Thanks so much. It's truly an honor and pleasure to be part of this again. And it's always wonderful to be with Fred and Dahlia and Paul. It really was an amazing term of the Supreme Court. I'd like to begin our discussion by making three observations. First, I'd start with the question, why was this term different from all other terms? Many reasons. One is the court decided fewer cases. The court decided only 53 cases with signed opinions after briefing and oral argument. That's the fewest number since 1862, early in the Civil War. In part, that's because the court put 10 of the cases that we heard over for argument next year. But even if those cases had been heard and decided, still it would have been a maximum of 63 decisions, a very small number. Also, oral arguments were canceled in March and April. The last time that happened was in October 1919, during the Spanish flu. The Supreme Court held telephonic oral arguments in May. That's something that never happened before. And the court did live audio broadcasts of those arguments. The Supreme Court has been so resistant to any form of live broadcast, video or audio. It was so notable that all of us could participate in a way by listening into the arguments, and many did. And of all of the changes, all the things that made this past term unique, this is the one that I hope will carry over into the future. I hope when the justices return to their courtroom, they'll continue to have at least live audio broadcasts of all the arguments. My second observation 
It was truly the John Roberts Court. We always refer to the court by the name of the Chief Justice, but I know that until he retired, many thought of it as the Anthony Kennedy Court, or before that, where she retired, the Sandra Day O'Connor Court. But in every way, this year was the John Roberts Court. Roberts was in the majority in 97% of all of the decisions this term. He dissented only twice. As I'm sure everyone knows, when the chief is in the majority, the chief gets to a sign who writes the majority opinion. And he signed himself writing some of the most important majority opinions of the term. So for example, he wrote the majority opinion in the case that said that President Trump could not rescind DACA. He wrote the majority opinion in the two cases involving subpoenas of President Trump's financial records. He wrote the majority opinion in one of the important religion cases we'll be talking about, Espinosa's Montana Department of Revenue. He wrote the majority opinion in an important separation of powers case. When Anthony Kennedy retired, many remarked that John Roberts would become ideologically the median justice on the court. Or to put it in a more colloquial way, he would be the swing justice. And we certainly saw that this term. But I can't think of a time when it was the chief justice who was the median justice, the chief who was the swing justice. We saw this term, how much John Roberts controls the future of so many areas of constitutional law. My third observation is, is a term that was very difficult to describe from an ideological perspective. After the term ended on July 9th, many media outlets commented and said, this was an unusually liberal term. I think that's a great oversimplification. Let me give a statistic to show why. This past term, there were 14 5-4 decisions. In 10 of those 14 cases, the majority was Roberts, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh. In two of the 14, the majority was Roberts, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sonora, and Kagan. Just that statistic would belie a conclusion that overall it was a liberal term. As I said, it's a term that defies easy ideological characterization. There were certainly some surprising liberal victories, and we'll talk about some of those cases. The important decision of the Supreme Court said that Title VII prohibits employment discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. The important case where the Supreme Court said that President Trump could not rescind DACA the important case where the Supreme Court struck down Louisiana law imposing restrictions on abortion. But there were also many important cases where the conservative position prevailed. We're gonna be talking about three religious freedom cases today. And in all of them, the conservative position is the one that won in the Supreme Court. The separation of powers case I mentioned, seal the law versus Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, again, was a conservative victory, five to four. And then there are cases that seem to court having a more moderate position. I think of the Trump subpoena cases, and especially the case concerning the ability of Congress to subpoena financial records concerning the president. The court rejected the absolute immunity position of the president, but the court also rejected the position of the DC circuit, that the president had no special protections from subpoena. The court seemed to take a more moderate position. In fact, I think what we learned about the ideology of the Roberts Court this term is there's a definite continuum among the justices. Going from right to left, at the farthest right, you have Justices Thomas and Alito. Justice Thomas certainly takes the most extreme position in some cases, saying that precedent doesn't matter. Justice Alito wrote some very angry dissents this term, and often they were alone in dissent. I think then you've got Justice Kavanaugh. He almost always voted in conservative direction, but sometimes he didn't join Thomas and Alito and seemed to want to take a softer position. Then you've got Justice Gorsuch, certainly very conservative, but sometimes his textualist originalist approach lead him to surprising results. He wrote the majority opinion in the case that said that Title VII prohibits sex orientation and gender identity discrimination. In the middle, as I said, you've got Chief Justice Roberts. Then you've got Justices Breyer and Kagan. To be sure they're liberal, but in some cases, they didn't join with Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor. In two of the religion cases, they were part of a 7-2 majority with the conservative justices. And then, the farthest left of the court, you've got Justice Ginsburg and Sotomayor, and often they were alone in dissents. I think as lawyers approach the Roberts Court, 
next year, and as long as these are the nine justices, it's important to think of it as not a monolith of conservatives and liberals, but really a continuum of justices along the ideological spectrum. But maybe most of all, what distinguishes this term is the number of blockbuster cases in so many areas of the law, so many cases that affect people, the most intimate, important aspects of their lives. And that's what we're talking about for the next hour and a half. So one of those aspects is immigration. And before we get into it, I did want to make a note on language because there are places in U.S. law, including in this year's Supreme Court decisions, where non-U.S. citizens are referred to as aliens. And although this is the current federal legal terminology, it's dehumanizing and it's increasingly falling out of favor among immigration advocates and at the local legislative level where terms such as non-citizen are being adopted instead. Now, one of the most anticipated decisions this year was in the case regarding DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Almost 700,000 immigrants depend on this program for work authorization and relief from deportation. Fred, what does the court's decision mean for them? Thank you, Karen. Also, I wanted to uh, thank Erwin for this partnership of two decades. The first time we did this together was about 20 years ago, and we've had Paul and Dahlia as part of the team now for a while. Uh, this has become a great program and a real anchor of our summer. We always did it right after the term concluded in July, so that's another difference to add to why is this term different from all others, as Erwin said. Uh, we get, let the court run its course, and we uh, let them finish up and began to gather here together in August. So there are two immigration cases I want to talk about. The DACA case is obviously the one that got the greatest amount of attention. Um, in 2017, um, quite dramatically, the Trump administration announced that it was going to end the DACA program, which, as Karen said, uh, provided for the um, so-called uh, dreamers, the uh, children of non-citizens who would come here, who then uh, came to the United States as, as very young people. Um, DACA gave them a shield from deportation, gave them the ability to work legally to access other benefits like health insurance and social security. So the decision in 2017 to end the program uh, set off quite a firestorm. Uh, but let's step back for a second. There's no question uh, for the court, or I think anyone who's looked at this, that the Trump administration has the power to end DACA. Uh, the, the question is, did they do it the right way? Did they do it a legal way as a matter of administrative law and under the Administrative Procedure Act? Uh, the, the case that we're looking at uh, was brought by, among others, a number of universities, the lead plaintiff, the University of California. Uh, and I should add that the, the Phi Beta Kappa Society, which I'm privileged to lead, was one of the organizations that joined a brief of higher education institutions and organizations in support of the position of the University of California. The this is the first of the cases, as Erwin said, where we see the Chief Justice as the swing vote and the Chief Justice as really playing the key role in this case and the Chief Justice being in the majority assigning himself this case. It is Chief Justice Roberts plus the, the four more liberal justices uh, taking the position that in fact, the effort to end DACA by the administration uh, was not lawful under the Administrative um, Procedure Act. Uh, as a threshold matter, the court had to deal with the issue of whether the court even had the power to review the decision to rescind DACA. Uh, why is that even an issue? Because under the Administrative Procedure Act, agencies' decisions not to bring enforcement actions are in fact not justici uh, justiciable. They're not judicially reviewable. But the majority said that DACA itself is not a passive non-enforcement policy, but rather uh, it is a policy for conferring affirmative immigration relief, and thus it is reviewable by the courts. Uh, the majority then considered the, whether the Trump administration had followed the Administrative Procedure Act, and there were a couple of things that they focused on in particular. Um, one that, um, well, I should actually say where they set the bar. Uh, under the Administrative Procedure Act, it's a pretty low bar that gets set. The question is whether it meets the standard of reasoned decision making, but the court said that in fact, the administration had not met that standard of reasoned decision making. Uh, one reason is that the reason given for the action kept changing, and the court took specific note of this. Uh, and the, the law is that the administration is bound by the reason that it gives at the time it takes the administrative decision. It can't keep changing the decisions as they go. So there was a 2017 rationale, it changed in 2018, and the court refused to consider that post hoc rationalization, saying that it did not represent the agency's 
actual reasoning at the time that it took the action of rescinding DACA. Second, that at the time that they rescinded DACA, uh, the, the reason that was given uh, was that the extension of benefits to undocumented immigrants, like the ability to work legally in the United States, uh, was considered by the administration to be illegal. Um, however, uh, the court said the agency didn't explain why, even if that's true, even if DACA's benefits are illegal, uh, why the protections from deportation were also illegal. You could certainly uh, say that the benefit shouldn't be extended, but that wouldn't lead to deportation. So the rationale did not meet that minimal standard of reasoned decision-making, uh, according to the majority. I should just say a word or two about uh, dissents, but first a concurrence. Um, and here, again, as Erwin said, Justice Sotomayor is over uh, on the, uh, the liberal end of the court and wrote a, um, I would say, a, a passionate, strongly worded uh, dissent in which, uh, not dissent, concurrence, in which she said she would have allowed the challengers to develop on remand uh, their claim that the rescission of DACA was in fact motivated by the intent to discriminate, a very strong uh, uh, charge, obviously. Uh, the other four in the majority found that the plaintiffs had not made a sufficient case to draw an inference of discriminatory intent, but it's worth noticing that Justice Sotomayor had staked out that position. In his dissent, uh, Justice Thomas said, um, and I'm quoting here, the Trump administration rescinded DACA the same way the Obama administration created it, unilaterally and through a mere memorandum. Um, he so on that basis argued that the Department of Homeland Security's decision to end the illegal action was automatically legal. Let, let me just briefly mention one other immigration case. That's Department of Homeland Security against um, Thurisidgian. Um, this is a case that involves the um, provision under the 1996 uh, Illegal Immigrant Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, the 1996 Immigration Reform Act, uh, under which immigration officials are allowed to make the decision immediately uh, to deport without a hearing anyone who is apprehended within 100 miles of a border and cannot prove that they have lived in the country for more than two weeks. Uh, one of the exceptions to this is the expedited removal process um, for asylum seekers. If a non-citizen expresses a fear of persecution, the officer must refer that to an asylum officer for what's known as a credible fear interview. Uh, if the asylum officer finds that there's a significant possibility that the applicant's asylum claim would succeed, then that applicant is given a full immigration hearing. In this case, the applicant was apprehended within 25 feet of the United States border. He claimed uh, asylum because he feared persecution in his home country of Sri Lanka, where he had been kidnapped and beaten. After a credible fear interview, the asylum officer found that there was no significant possibility in that officer's uh, view uh, that the Thurgisian would qualify for an asylum to, um, in a full hearing, and therefore an immigration judge upheld the decision uh, after a cursory review based on that. He then filed a habeas petition in which he alleged that the asylum officer had erred by not considering relevant factors about the identity, motives of his attackers, and he also claimed that the expedited asylum procedure itself violates due process because he was not given certain adequate safeguards, such as a competent translator, an opportunity to present uh, country condition reports. This decision was seven to two, author, offered, authored by Justice Alito, um, and the court said that, in fact, whether asylum seekers, such as this individual, may file a habeas petition um, to review any legal or constitutional errors um, itself uh, is, the, is the question, and the court said, no, under the immigration law, they may not. Justice Alito wrote that the that the Constitution, at the time the Constitution was adopted, habeas was traditionally provided as a means to seek release from unlawful detention. He didn't seek release, after all, from custody, but rather an opportunity to obtain asylum. Therefore, Justice Alito said that the claims fall outside the scope of the writ of habeas corpus. On the due process issue, 
uh, Justice Alito's opinion noted that newly arrived non-citizens do not have the same constitutional protection as non-citizens who are already within the country. So that was an opinion for five justices. There's another example of what Erwin said about looking at our continuum. So justices, Justice Breyer, in an opinion that Justice Ginsburg joined, concurred, but he said he would have focused solely on the facts of this case, and that was in fact the issue that was certified here for appeal, what happened to this particular individual. He said we need not and should not reach the general issue of whether the suspension clause uh, of the Constitution with respect to suspending habeas corpus has anything to say about people challenging removal from the country. The dissent here was by Justice Sotomayor, uh, joined by Justice Kagan this time. Um, it is a, again, a strongly worded dissent in which he argues that the majority's decision makes expedited remo removal asylum denials functionally unreviewable. Um, she, uh, joining Justice Alito's history, uh, looks at the history uh, at the time of the founding of the Republic and says in 1789, we essentially had an open border policy and there would have been no uh, immigration analog for habeas at that time. Uh, she argued that since its inception, habeas has been used to prevent the executive branch from creating an arbitrary administrative scheme and should be permitted to do so in this case. So being mindful of time, I do have one follow-up question regarding DACA. Since the decision has been handed down, the administration has issued a new memo announcing that they're changing the length of DACA grants from two years to one year, refusing to allow new initial applications for DACA, and refusing to open up advance parole for current DACA recipients. Paul, is this compliant with the Supreme Court decision? What practical implications does it have for recipients? And what does it mean for the balance of powers between the executive and judicial branches? So, Karen, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the action that followed the Supreme Court decision, in my view, sort of underscores, you know, what the Supreme Court decision was, was really about. I mean, Fred does a great job of explaining sort of the doctrine of the case and what the court's reasoning was. But as Fred said at the outset, one of the oddities of this case is that no one really doubts that if the executive branch had done it, affirmatively and forcefully and just said, as a matter of policy, we are gonna discontinue the prior administration's policy, that they could have done that lawfully. And, and I think that when you think about this decision, I think what really explains this decision and certainly explains the Chief Justice's vote in this case is really accountability. I think there was a sense that the administration, because DACA is a popular program, uh, because the individuals who benefit from it are incredibly sympathetic individuals. I don't think that the administration really wanted to take the hit, uh, the kind of accountability hit of being forthright about discontinuing a popular policy. And so they clouded their reasoning and sort of suggested that it was part because of illegality and part because of policy without being very specific about which one it was. And I think, you know, there was a sense that the Chief Justice may have had that the administration was essentially passing the buck to the courts to have the courts be the ones who were responsible for ending DACA when the administration wasn't as forthright as it could be. So there's a sense in putting aside the, the legalities of the new policy, there is a sense in which it kind of accomplishes the court's mission of getting the administration to be more accountable and also underscores the popularity of the program at bottom, because when there was a need to formulate a new policy in the wake of the decision, the administration didn't take the path of forthrightly discontinuing the program, but actually ended up renewing it, though, as you suggest, in a way that was more limited than the prior policy. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to religious freedom. A trio of decisions this term about the relationship between religion and government substantially shifted how the law is going to operate in this area moving forward. Dahlia, can you please tell us about Espinoza v. Montana Department of Revenue? Sure, and I also want to just join my voice to my co-panelists to say what a treat it is to be back, uh, although like everyone, I wish we were at the Constitution Center. Um, 
so, so as Karen says, this is one of three uh, really important uh, religion cases that I, I think Irwin's going to say it better when he frames it, but I think that one way to think about it is in a lot of uh, the cases we saw this year, the, the court giveth and the court taketh away. Uh, and I think uh, under the guise of religious liberty, the court taketh away some of uh, the big ticket uh, uh, wins that we saw and will continue to discuss. So Espinoza uh, versus Montana Department of Revenue stems out of a 2015 decision by the Montana legislature to create a scholarship program that would provide a tax credit for donations to private scholarship organizations. What it meant is that you could use the money to fund scholarships for children who are attending private schools. And in Montana, that functionally meant religious schools. Uh, in 2018, the Montana Supreme Court struck down the program, uh, said that it violated the state's constitution, not the federal constitution, the state constitutional ban on aid for churches and religious schools. Uh, this no aid provision in uh, the state constitution, actually 37 uh, states have these no aid provisions, and they essentially provide for stronger separation of church and state than the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. Uh, they really do expressly prohibit direct or indirect government funding of religious schools. And I should note that uh, the ADL joined in an amicus brief in this case that argued that longstanding Supreme Court precedent allows states to do that, to provide for stricter uh, church-state separation than the First Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, in a 5-4 decision that came down in June, uh, penned by Chief Justice John Roberts, the court held that actually the free exercise clause barred Montana from excluding the religious schools and parents who wanted to send their kids to religious schools uh, barred them uh, uh, for uh, killing this program and revived the program. And it's interesting because I remember we talked about Trinity Lutheran two years ago uh, in this space. The Chief Justice built really heavily on Trinity Lutheran. That was a case from 2017, another one of those seven to two religion cases. Uh, that becomes a through line to this term. And in Trinity Lutheran, uh, the Supreme Court had held that there was a Missouri law that blocked religious schools from receiving benefits from a program that in that case gave rubber tire resurfacing materials to keep children um, from bonking their heads uh, in playgrounds. And the court said, uh, in that case, uh, you can't keep uh, a religious school from benefiting from that program. So John Roberts builds on that quite heavily in Espinoza, finding that the Montana Supreme Court ruling uh, when they rescinded the program violates the free exercise clause by discriminating on the basis of religious identity. And he goes on to say that religious schools in Montana are being excluded from participating in this scholarship program without any examination of whether the scholarships were gonna be used for religious purposes or secular purposes. And he goes on to say that the no aid provision in Montana state constitution clearly prohibits religious schools from receiving funds through this program simply because they are religious schools and it is therefore subject to quote the strictest scrutiny and can only survive if it's narrowly tailored to promote interests quote of the highest order and obviously this calls into question voucher programs around the country uh, that now exist and raises the question whether uh, the states that have vouchers um, can now uh, uh, really in any way avoid funding uh, religious education. Uh, so I think under the guise of building on what looked like a modest ruling in tw Trinity Lutheran uh, has really shifted the goalposts for what comes next. Uh, worth noting that Justice Ginsburg dissented in an opinion that was joined by Elena Kagan, saying that the Montana um, Supreme Court had actually invalidated the entire program. No one was getting any benefits, uh, secular or religious, and therefore nobody was being uh, discriminated against uh, based on religion. Uh, Justice Breyer uh, went further. He filed a dissent uh, warning that this approach uh, and conclusion, quote, risk the kind of entanglement in conflict that the establishment and free exercise clauses are intended to prevent. 
that in fact, this is going to foment uh, much more uh, questions about uh, the funding of uh, religious education. And Justice Thomas, joined by uh, Justice Gorsuch in a separate dissent, asserted that the whole notion of separating church and state in America, quote, communicates a message that religion is dangerous and in need of policing. He says this has had the effect of turning society uh, toward devaluing religion altogether. And he uh, would have, uh, writes Justice Thomas, uh, the idea that just anything that enforces the separation of church and state de uh, devalues religion and creates in and of itself religious hostility and all of it needs to end immediately. So I think that what we saw just using Irwin's, mapping onto Irwin's analysis is a sort of moderate but consequential shift uh, from Trinity Lutheran on the part of the Chief Justice and a really dramatic staking out of a new position uh, on, not a new position, but a, a very extreme position uh, on the part of Justice Thomas. Oh, you argued Little Sisters of the Poor v. Pennsylvania. Can you tell us about that case and your experience arguing it via teleconference? Sure, Karen, I'd be very happy to. You know, I'll just echo first, uh, both very happy to be with you again, and also Dahlia's point that the Espinosa case is a very big deal. It, you know, wasn't that long ago that the hard constitutional question was whether you could include religious schools in a voucher program at all. And now the court has essentially held that if you're going to have a voucher program, uh, you essentially have to include religious schools. So it is quite a monumental decision. And as Irwin alluded to, you know, I think that if you didn't have the religious freedom this case, the religious freedom cases this term, all of which went in a more conservative direction, I think it really would have affected the perception of the term as a whole. One of those cases, as you said, that I argued is the Little Sisters of the Poor case. Uh, I argued it telephonically, which was a new experience for me. Um, you know, as you alluded to in the introductions, I've argued a uh, hundred cases, but uh, arguing over the telephone uh, was a new experience. Uh, another new experience was getting a question from Justice Thomas. And one of the kind of unexpected, kind of pleasant, I think, ramifications of the court's format of going both to a telephonic format, but then also going to a kind of seriatim questioning where the justices ask questions in order of seniority and Justice Thomas being the senior associate justice kind of asked questions early in the arguments. Uh, previously when he's been asked why he didn't ask more questions at oral argument, he suggested that most of the other justices had already asked his questions. Uh, and this format sort of gave him a unique opportunity to go early in the argument um, and he did ask questions, I think, in every one of the arguments that was uh, argued telephonically in May. So that was quite a, quite a novel experience. Uh, the decision itself was a 7-2 uh, sort of victory for, I suppose you would say, the administration and the Little Sisters of the Poor, uh, who were my client. This is all part of this long-running saga about the contraception mandate that was put in place in the prior administration as an administrative matter after the Affordable Care Act was passed. The, Accord the Affordable Care Act had a provision that said that qualifying uh, health insurance programs need to have preventive services for women that are covered in a cost-free way. And as a matter of administrative action, the administration had decided in the previous administration that those cost-free services had to include all of the FDA approved forms of contraception. That was obviously uh, very controversial in some religious groups that had religious objections to those uh, forms, some of those forms or all of those forms of contraception and objected to providing them as part of their basic healthcare package. And so there's been about a decade long piece of litigation involving whether or not there is a valid claim under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act for religious employers to be exempted from the obligation to comply with the contraception mandate. Uh, that litigation sort of came to an impasse at the end of the Obama administration, um, and the court heard a previous case when they were down to just eight justices because Justice Scalia had passed in the term that they heard the case. And they kind of ended up 
sort of sending it back to the administration to see if something could be worked out. Nothing could be worked out before the end of the Obama administration, but when the Trump administration came in, they essentially amended the rules to exempt the religious objecting employers, including the Little Sisters. That rule exempting the religious employers was then challenged uh, by a number of states, including the state of Pennsylvania, or Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to be precise. And those challenges were successful in the lower courts. And so the Third Circuit, for example, unanimously enjoined uh, the administration rule exempting the religious employers. That issue came up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, I think by a fairly surprising margin, if not a surprising result, the court seven to two reversed the Third Circuit and said that this challenge to the Trump administration's uh, accommodation of religious exercise and exemption of religious exercise was permissible. Justices Breyer and Justice Kagan uh, wrote separately to essentially say that they agreed with the more conservative justices in the majority that this particular challenge failed, but they suggested there might be another way of challenging what the administration had done uh, that might be available for uh, in the lower courts as the case gets remanded. But the, the, the net result of this decision is that this Trump administration rule uh, will go into effect. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that all of this has been done in varying administrations by administration, administrative rule rather than statute. So if, say, in January of 2021, there's a new administration, there might be yet another policy that might yet again lead to yet another Supreme Court case involving this recurring issue. But for now, uh, the Little Sisters prevailed in this case, and as I said, prevailed by a 7-2 margin. Sorry about that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, being mindful of the time, the third case involved employment discrimination and what's called the ministerial exception. Fred, can you please tell us about the ministerial exception and how it's affected by the court's decision in Our Lady of Guadalupe School v. Morris A. Baruch? Sure. The ministerial exception is a First Amendment doctrine that limits the impact of certain kinds of discrimination laws on religious institutions, allowing those institutions uh, where issues of faith and their own religious structure is involved uh, not to be uh, interfered with by any legislation or any, um, any government role. Um, the, uh, the, the touchstone for this case is a case called um, uh, Hosanna Tabor, a tw uh, 2012 case in which uh, a teacher in a school who was in fact a minister uh, herself, carried the title of minister, uh, sued for discrimination in the court and the, the response of the school was, she's a minister, uh, we have to decide what we want to do with respect to people who are involved in inculcation of faith and teaching faith. We have decisions we have to make and the court upheld that. That's the so-called ministerial exception. Our two cases, Our Lady of Guadalupe School uh, being one, uh, involved two cases where non-ministers, teachers in Catholic schools, they didn't have priest or minister or clerical titles, um, challenged uh, decisions that were made affecting their employment, in one case age discrimination, in other case disability discrimination. Um, and the school uh, in each case said, no, 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 this falls under the ministerial exception uh, yet again, and you cannot uh, get discrimination claims for this. Um, the response, of course, of the plaintiffs is that they're not min uh, ministers per se. Uh, the court in a seven to two decision said that the ministerial exception is not limited to ministers or clerics per se. It is more of a functional test looking at a variety of different factors, what their role is, what their, uh, what their training is, what the positions they're involved in at the institution. Um, and on that basis, the court said that the, uh, in each case, the discrimination claim would have to fail. The school had the right to decide what they wanted to do with respect to these employees. Uh, two, two very brief notes on this, and again, it's the same names that keep coming up. Uh, a, just, a Justice Sotomayor dissent, um, uh, which is a, a powerful dissent in which she says, there's, there's, this is now an, an exception with no, with no limitation, and that religious schools are now exempt, uh, or could be exempt from all discrimination laws. Uh, it, it may not even be limited to people actually teaching doctrine in some way, uh, it, 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 it has no end and that therefore she would have uh, decided the other way and would have put much more limit on it. On the other side, uh, Justice Thomas uh, wrote separately uh, 
to say that although he thinks the majority of the court got it right, Justice Alito wrote the opinion for the uh, the majority uh, that the court would have got it right, he would just defer to any good faith claim by a religious institution that this is somebody covered by the exception. So that would essentially give the institution the right to exempt themselves uh, in except in bad faith claims of such an exemption uh, for a ministerial exemption. The majority settled on a kind of functional test but one that still has the result of giving pretty broad discretion to religious institutions to make employment decisions and be relatively exempt from discrimination laws. Erwin, in just two to three minutes, could you draw any broad conclusions from these rulings? Sure. I think we're in the midst of seeing a dramatic shift within the Supreme Court with regard to the religion clauses of the First Amendment. For over a half century, we've had a relatively robust establishment clause and a relatively weak free exercise clause. In 1947, all nine justices said that the establishment clause should be understood in the words of Thomas Jefferson, creating a wall that separates church and state. And I think the most important free exercise clause case was in 1990, when Employment Division versus Smith, the court said, that religions don't get exceptions from general laws. But now what we're seeing in the current court is a conservative majority that wants a very weak establishment clause and a very robust free exercise clause. In terms of the establishment clause, conservative justice to see very little that violates it. Conservatives have long taken the position that the establishment clause is violated only if the government coerces religious participation when giving benefits discriminates among religions. Now I think there's five justices take that position. We saw it a term ago in American Legion versus American Human Association, in the court allowing a 45-foot cross at a busy intersection on public property. We saw it several terms ago in the town of Greece versus Galloway, where the court said it didn't violate the Establishment Clause to have Christian clergy deliver Christian prayers for many years before town meetings. I think for these conservative justices, very little will violate the Establishment Clause. They will allow much more in terms of religious symbols on government property, much more religious involvement in government activities, and very little in the way of government aid will violate the Establishment Clause. But at the same time, the conservative justices want a very robust free exercise clause. We saw that this term in the Espinoza case that Dahlia talked about, the Our Lady Guadalupe case that Paul talked about. I think we're seeing a conservative majority that's likely to create religious exceptions from employment discrimination laws. Masterpiece Cake Shop from a couple of years ago didn't resolve the issue of whether there is a religious exception from civil rights laws, but that's going to be back before the court the next term. And so I think what you're seeing is a very dramatic shift in the jurisprudence of the Establishment Clause from what the law has been for decades. And I think the cases this term are part of that, reflect that, and as we've talked about, really do change the law. Thank you, Erwin. Uh, let's also discuss the Title VII case, which in some ways is related to religious liberty as well. This term also saw, it saw a significant step forward in LGBTQIA plus rights in this Title VII employment decision. Sadly, Amy Stevens, one of the plaintiffs, passed away prior to the decision being issued. Paul, can you tell us more about this ruling? Sure, I'd be happy to. And I think this is really one of the headliner cases of the term uh, in terms of uh, the kind of importance of the cases. And a lot of people presumably know something about this case. So I'll try to be relatively brief. But the, the, this case involves whether the basic prohibition in federal law against employment decision, d discrimination, which is Title VII, applies to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or transgender status. The text of the statute, and certainly for the majority opinion, the text is important here. Uh, the text of Title VII uh, prohibits employment discrimination, quote, because of sex. And that, in relevant part, is the language that has existed in the statute since 1964 when the statute was passed. And a strong majority of the court, six justices, in an opinion written by Justice Gorsuch, held in the Bostock case, which became the case under which a variety of uh, separate cases were a group. In the Bostock case, he ruled that Title VII does prohibit employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation 
or, and transgender status as part of its prohibition of discrimination on the basis of sex. In a nutshell, the reasoning of the majority is that if discrimination takes sex into account, even in part, and the majority then held that sexual orientation and discrimination on the basis of transgender status take sex into account, at least in part, um, then it is covered by the statute and is prohibited by the statute. Uh, there was a very, uh, I think it's fair to say, passionate dissent in this case written by Justice Alito and joined by Justice Thomas. There are a number of different ways to measure sort of how vehement or passionate a dissent is. I think one fair measure though is that when the dissent is longer than the majority opinion, uh, the dissenter felt pretty strongly about the issue. And in this case, you had a 33 page majority opinion and you had a 54 page principal dissent by Justice Alito. Uh, perhaps another metric of how strongly he felt is he included not just a 54 page dissent, but a 53 page appendix uh, that included a variety of statutes and provisions that he thought was relevant in the case. Uh, as I think was alluded to perhaps by Irwin in the intro, uh, Justice Kavanaugh also dissented, but he wrote separately and kind of pointedly did not join uh, Justice Alito's dissent, dissenting opinion. Um, I just want to make two quick points about uh, the decision in terms of, uh, you know, maybe points that kind of are fascinating to me as an advocate and a watcher of the court. The first is uh, the plaintiffs in this case invoked a very interesting and I think bold strategy in that their focus was entirely on the text of the statute and they didn't really even bother to claim that Congress in 1964 thought that in prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sex, they were also prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and transgender status. Obviously, just historically, that would have been a tough argument to make, but it was a bold tactical choice by the litigants to essentially concede that in 1964, Congress did not have this in mind but to essentially put all their eggs in the textualist basket. And part of the reason as an advocate, it's interesting to see that strategy is because it succeeded so spectacularly in the end by getting this strong textual endorsement of the argument. The second interesting thing, and I think this really may suggest kind of one of the issues that the court will have to wrestle with in the future is how the court dealt with the issue of potential religious objections uh, to the statute and extending it to sexual orientation and transgender status. One of probably the better arguments that the dissenters had in this case is that when legislatures historically have dealt expressly with the issue of sexual orientation or less frequently transgender status, they have often as part of the legislation created some kind of conscious objection or religious objection to the prohibition and the statute. And the argument went that since Congress didn't expressly confront this issue in 1964, there's no comparable exemption for religious employers of the like. I mean, there are actually some in the statute, but not because Congress wrestled directly with prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. The response in the majority opinion to that argument was interesting because Justice Gorsuch alluded to the possibility that perhaps the Religious Freedom Restoration Act would allow some employers essentially to have a defense uh, in these cases, even though their discrimination violated Title VII. And I think by the majority dealing with that argument in that particular way, almost guarantees that that's an issue that will make its way back to the Supreme Court in the next few years. Taking just one minute more on this case to ask a clarifying question. Um, as Paul just said, the ruling would appear to apply to sexual orientation and transgender status, but throughout the ruling, the court seems to use terms including homosexual and sexual orientation and transgender and gender identity interchangeably. But these terms do mean distinct things. Fred, what, if anything, does this mean for lower courts' interpretation of whether everyone in the LGBTQIA plus community is covered under Title VII employment discrimination? Well, I think it really follows on what, what Paul was saying. I think we're going to 
not only see the court revisit this, but lower courts are going to revisit this. And there's a lot of room for limitation on the reach of this opinion. Uh, Linda Greenhouse, I think, brilliantly described um, in terms of was this a liberal or a conservative court term to go back to where we started here. She said many of the liberal opinions are in the form of yes, but. Uh, and many of the conservative opinions are in the form of yes and. Uh, so this is one of those yes buts. Uh, and I suspect that there will be lots of litigation in the lower courts uh, and they will be pulling apart different issues of LGBTQ plus issues, um, many of which the Supreme Court is very happy to leave to be worked out by lower courts for the time being. Um, but this is only the beginning of a discussion and my guess is it may be seen as the high watermark of it and you may see it cut back um, in the, um, at least judicially, if not legislatively. Erwin, would you like to take a minute to share a few thoughts about Comcast Corp, the National Association of African American Owned Media? Sure. The country is in the midst of a long overdue focus on race and anti blackness. There was only one Supreme Court case this term that directly dealt with race. It was the case you mentioned, Comcast versus National Association of African Media. The civil rights position lost here. I should disclose that I was the attorney for the losing side. I'm envious that Paul got to talk about a case where he prevailed, and I talked about a case where I lost nine to nothing. The case involved 42 United States Code Section 1981, which prohibits race discrimination in contracting. It was adopted as part of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. My client, Byron Allen, is the owner of several cable channels. He asked Comcast to carry them. They refused. They gave him a series of requirements to meet, spent a great deal of money and met them. They then said that they had no bandwidth available for him. One of the Comcast officials allegedly said to him, we don't want to create any more Bob Johnsons, referring to the head of the Black Entertainment Television Network. He sued under Section 1981. The district court dismissed, but the Ninth Circuit reversed and said, it's enough that the complaint alleged that race was a motivating factor for the denial of contracts. The Supreme Court nine to nothing reversed, just as Gorsuch wrote for the court, and the court said that in order to have a complaint that can go forward, in order to prevail, has to be alleged and proven that race was the but-for cause for the denial of contract. He said but-for causation is the backdrop of tort law. It has to be assumed that it's the standard for all civil rights statutes unless Congress specifies otherwise. Why does this matter? Well, first, but for causation is a lot harder to allege and prove than it is to show that race is a motivating factor. Simple example, imagine someone goes to rent a hotel room. The proprietor says, we don't have any rooms available. And besides, we don't rent to African-American people. Imagine a complaint that just lays out those facts. It's enough that race is a motivating factor, the complaint can go forward. But it's not enough if race has to be shown to be the but for cause. Also, I think the case is significant because it's not just going to be about 1981. Justice Gorsuch's opinion says all civil rights statutes should be assumed to have but for causation unless Congress provides otherwise. And finally, it's important to note, as I implied, that the court says that but for causation has to be plausibly alleged in the complaint and it has to be proven in order to ultimately recover. It's the same standard for both pleading and proof. So I think this is a very significant loss for civil rights plaintiffs. June Medical Services was a reproductive rights case this term that was nearly identical to a case from June 2016, Whole Woman's Health, with the most significant difference being the makeup of the court. Dahlia, what was this case about and what distinguished this ruling from the ruling in Whole Woman's Health? Uh, yeah, this was a Groundhog Day case. Uh, it involved abortion restrictions that are functionally identical to the ones that the court, uh, as you said, uh, had already struck down in 2016 in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt. Uh, Louisiana required that abortion providers obtain what's called admitting privileges at a hospital within 30 miles of their clinic. And for lots of complicated reasons that the district court found in depth, it's very, very difficult to obtain uh, admitting privileges in part because hospitals can deny for lots of reasons, including uh, objections to abortion, also because uh, abortions are just simply don't land you up in a hospital very frequently. They're just safer uh, than uh, many other comparable procedures. Mm -hmm. Uh, if Louisiana had allowed this to go into effect, the entire state would have been left with just one doctor uh, 
uh, authorized to terminate pregnancies. And as you said, uh, this had already been struck down in Whole Women's Health. That was decided, uh, recall, when the court was 5-3 uh, because Justice Scalia had died. Uh, and the court had held that these admitting privileges uh, in Texas imposed a, quote, undue burden uh, on the right to abortion, building on 1992's Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So as you say, because the law is functionally indistinguishable, the Supreme Court could have just easily batted it away. Uh, I should note that ADL joined with the National Women's Law Center and 71 other organizations on an amicus brief urging that they do uh, just that. But as you said, the court had changed. Anthony Kennedy, who had, was the fifth vote in Whole Women's Health, had retired. Brett, Brett Kavanaugh had been uh, seated in his place. And uh, the Fifth Circuit had actually defied uh, precedent and said, we're going to go ahead and uphold the Louisiana law, this time, I think, on the theory that Louisiana is just different. Um, so the question really became, was John Roberts, who was very definitely a dissenter in Whole Women's Health, going to stand for uh, his objection uh, to the uh, uh, abortion laws, or was he going to stand for stare decisis? Uh, this actually turns into a 441 opinion in some sense, because Breyer, who had authored Whole Women's Health, went back and applied the test that he had created in Whole Women's Health, which broadened a little bit the test for what undue burden and substantial obstacle meant after Casey. And he created a kind of a balancing test in which courts would have to analyze whether there are any benefits to the purported uh, abortion regulation, these so-called trap laws. Uh, but while Roberts signed on, uh, I think we've classed this uh, with the yes but uh, category of cases. He did sign on, but he only agreed with Justice Breyer that uh, the case uh, clearly uh, was the same as Whole Women's Health and that stare decisis demanded that uh, it be struck down in Louisiana. But he was very, very clear, I think, that uh, you know, that was the limit of where he was going to go. And I think he went further and did away with that added benefits analysis that Breyer had brought to the table uh, and essentially said, it's no longer the job of courts after uh, Whole Woman's Health to try to pierce the rationale for why the state says these, uh, these laws help women. Now, the only thing we're going to look at is sort of reinstating the Casey rule of, uh, is this uh, uh, an undue burden? So I think Roberts, alone among the conservatives, certainly agreed that Louisiana had shown massive, I guess the constitutional word is chutzpah, in trying to, you know, reenact a law that had just been struck down. But he was very, very clear uh, that uh, the test was different. And he also, I think, wrote uh, very, very clearly that he had dissented in Whole Women's Health uh, and that he still thinks that Whole Women's Health was wrongly decided. So I think that for those of us who look at John Roberts as having, quote unquote, saved reproductive rights, it's important to understand that 14 states have already passed laws that ban pre-viability abortion, clearly in violation of Casey. And what John Roberts, I think, is saying is, bring me a different law and I might rule differently. What I cannot do is violate uh, stare decisis in a case that is exactly the same as one the court has already heard. And just to conclude quickly, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that there were six written opinions in June Medical. Six people wrote, every single one of them was a man. There are three women who sit on the US Supreme Court, not one of them wrote a word in June Medical. Thank you, Dahlia. Uh, another significant decision that was issued on the last day of the term, but didn't get much attention was McGirt v. Oklahoma, which addressed US treaty obligations to the Muscogee Creek Nation which the decision referred to as the Creek Nation. Paul, can you give us some background on this case and talk about its implications for the Muscogee Creek Nation sovereignty and that of other Native American tribes? Sure, Karen. I promised I could do this case in about two minutes. So I'm gonna do it in a very telescoped way because 
I think that the, the history of this particular case, which like a lot of the Supreme Court's cases involving whether Native American reservations have been so-called disestablished, really turns on the facts of the case and the long history of a particular reservation. The typical pattern in this, these cases, and you really saw this in this particular case, is that you know, back in the 19th century, at some point, Congress very clearly gives to a Native American tribe a reservation and calls it that, and generally even specifies the meets and bounds of it. And then through later actions, kind of you know, chips away at that and either expressly uh, takes it away or just kind of allows people to act like it's no longer a reservation. And this case in Oklahoma kind of involved almost the most extreme of the latter case, where there was a clear grant of a reservation. And then over time, uh, it just was you know, so disregarded uh, that it really became a situation where under the statute, it looked like a, essentially the eastern half of Oklahoma was still a reservation. But in practice, there were large cities there that didn't look anything like you might typically associate with a reservation. And so that was the dynamic in the case. The court in a 5-4 decision by Justice Gorsuch took a very textualist approach. So there's one way of looking at this case that it's kind of you know, a, a sibling case with the Bostock case in that you have Justice Gorsuch adopting a very textualist result to come to what seems like a somewhat liberal uh, result, both because the Native Americans prevailed, but also the criminal defendant in this particular case uh, prevailed, because given the implications for the reservation continuing to exist, it meant uh, effectively that the criminal defendant was tried and convicted by the wrong authorities, um, and that he had an entitlement to a tribal, uh, a, a, a tribal court. Uh, the second thing that I'll say about it, and this is, the, I think, the even more important thing, is that this case, along with a decision from last term called Herrera, really shows that you know, the Native Americans, I think, have a receptive justice in Justice Gorsuch. And you know, that's, that's, that's something that I think could have some real impacts uh, down, the, down the road. I don't think this was just a textualist decision for Justice Gorsuch. I think it shows that you know, perhaps because of his Colorado roots, perhaps because of something else, he has a kind of instinctive sympathy for the claims of the Native American tribes that I think will be uh, really important to the Native American tribes going forward. The decisions that got a lot more attention on the last day of the term were the closely watched cases about the president's taxes, Trump v. Mazars and Trump v. Vance. Fred, can you tell us about these cases and their impact? Sure. And we could spend a good hour and a half on these cases, but instead we're going to spend about a minute and a half on these cases in the interest of time. Uh, one of these involves a subpoena coming from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Uh, another is a set of subpoenas coming from Congress. Um, one of the things that is, that is very interesting, and it's a good place for us to conclude in some ways, is that clearly there appears to have been a motivation here to try not to be split uh, in the court and not to be split uh, politically, uh, and the background for this is, don't forget, two of the most famous recent cases involving these kinds of presidential claims, uh, U.S. against Nixon, Clinton against Jones. Those were unanimous Supreme Court cases uh, against the president's claim of executive authority here. So that must have been in the background uh, for the judges. Uh, what you have is a pair of 7-2 decisions, uh, again, authored by the Chief Justice here. Um, and in both cases, finding something of a middle position, uh, but the, the main issue that the Chief Justice uh, highlights, and actually Justice Kavanaugh in his separate opinion picks up, the court was unanimous in rejecting an absolute immunity um, argument that had been put forward by the administration, that as long as the president is in power, uh, he, can, he is not subject to any uh, prosecution, not subject to any investigation or any authority that runs in this direction. That was eliminated, uh, rejected unanimously. What the court did say uh, is that on the Manhattan DA case, that it would go back on remand now for the district court to consider what the uh, 
to validity or other challenges of the subpoena might be. I'll just mention very briefly what you've all seen in the papers, that it looks as if that investigation in the Manhattan DA's office is broader than anyone thought at first. Uh, and it also is worth noting that that case is moving along faster than anyone thought. The mandate issued forthwith, which is a fancy way of saying the Supreme Court did not have the usual length of time before that remand hit the district court, it went instantly. And as a result, the district judge is already moving on that and in a very interesting way, it's going forward much faster than we thought. On the congressional uh, subpoenas, um, you get a middle position, which is to say not a heightened, heightened level of scrutiny for those subpoenas, um, but also not to be treated just like any other subpoena. The Chief Justice does say that there are a number of factors that have to be taken into account, the interference of the president, the specific need of Congress for their duties to get this kind of information. Clearly, the court was concerned about the potential for subpoenas to be able to be used uh, politically by Congress to harass a, this president or a future president, uh, but they were not willing to uh, limit Congress's authority completely in the way that the administration had asked them to do. Thanks. Karen, I think you're muted. Yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, Dahlia, let's come back to you for a few minutes on what we can expect from the court next term. We saw a number of decisions this term that shifted the relationship between religion and government and raised questions about whether religious institutions are subject to discrimination laws. What can we expect on this front next term, particularly with CERT having been granted in Fulton v. City of Philadelphia? Um, I'm going to try to do uh, what Fred just did, which is uh, compress six pages of notes into a minute and a half. So let's see how I do. Um, I, I would just start even before we get to um, Fulton. I think a couple of big themes just looking ahead, if I may. One is one of the court uh, cases that it pushed forward into next term, or when noted, there were a whole bunch that they held over. One of them is a challenge to the Affordable Care Act, and that is such an insanely consequential uh, case that uh, we haven't talked about today, but we should really think about uh, the fact that there is a challenge that threatens to do away uh, with the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, the other thing that I think is interesting just in terms of looking ahead uh, is gun cases. Uh, we had one on the docket this past year. It was long awaited. There has been immense impatience on the part of gun rights groups uh, for the Supreme Court to go ahead and broaden uh, the Second Amendment right to bear arms. Uh, it's been a very long time since that happened in Heller. And uh, not only did the court bat away uh, a gun challenge uh, because uh, it was now functionally moot, but the court, I think, was expected to add a whole bunch to the docket for next term and did not. Seems fairly clear that there is no fifth vote at the court right now to expansively uh, revisit uh, what the Second Amendment right to bear arms means. Uh, I have to also mention just leaking as part of looking ahead because we've seen, uh, and I warned the panel that as a gossipy journalist, I just have to note that the kinds of leaks we saw last week uh, at CNN.com, conversations uh, with Joan Biskupic for which she had seemingly multiple sources, including sources who were justices, uh, are bigger than any leak I've ever seen as a journalist, certainly I think bigger than the leaks we've seen since the Brethren. So I think it also uh, bespeaks a real internal anxiety at the court uh, going into an election year, an effort to undo, as Irwin talked about, some of the very, very savvy manipulating of the narrative uh, to undo that in the summer before uh, an election. Um, and I think also, and a lot of folks are asking about this in the chat, but I think the other thing we have to think about are court reform questions because uh, there is, uh, again, I think that the Chief Justice very, very deftly took the idea of court expansion or term limits uh, off uh, the menu for this summer during the election, but I think that that is also simmering under some of the anxieties that are being felt in-house at the court. Uh, you asked about Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. I remember we talked about this last year uh, on the stage uh, at the Constitution Center. This essentially involves the City of Philadelphia learning uh, in March of 2018 that some of the agencies that uh, it had hired to pro provide foster care for children uh, in the public child welfare system 
we're not licensing same-sex couples to be foster parents. The city informed those agencies they had to abide by the law uh, and Catholic Social Services sued the city claiming that the right to free exercise of religion entitled it to have the contract to perform these services even though it did not feel it could comply with the city's requirements that agencies accept um, all qualified families. Uh, that case, uh, the cert was granted uh, in February of 2020, and the court uh, will uh, hear it this year. And the only other thing I needed to touch on, because I think it might be the most important thing that we can uh, not do justice here uh, today, is just the voting, the voting cases and uh, what I've come to call the law of COVID and the franchise. Uh, we've seen a series of cases that really cut against what Irwin led with, which was that this t appeared to be a term in which John Roberts uh, was trying to modulate the extreme partisanship of some of his colleagues. Uh, in every single case that we've seen uh, involving different kinds of challenges to uh, uh, state voting apparatus as a result of uh, either COVID or uh, felon dis disenfranchisement in Florida, we've seen the court often late night orders, unsigned orders, per curiam orders, no reasons offered, uh, really circumscribing the right to vote time and time and time again. Uh, I can sort of just quickly say the court uh, in April uh, said that a Wisconsin regime that had intended to expand the amount of time that you could vote by mail, uh, the court 5-4 in an unsigned order uh, said, nope, can't do that. Uh, in, in July, uh, this is after the Florida uh, ballot initiative to re-enfranchise uh, felons uh, had passed overwhelmingly. Uh, and we saw in Florida that would have re-enfranchised 1.4 million uh, former felons. A lot, law signed by <laughs> Governor DeSantis said that those folks would have to pay all their fees, restitution, uh, and fines before they could vote. There is no way to figure out what those numbers are. Uh, lower court had said uh, we're going to go ahead and create an apparatus to try to re-enfranchise them. Um, and the Supreme Court 5-4 says no. Alabama uh, making it very, very hard for particularly elderly and uh, COVID susceptible folks to vote. Uh, some of the counties tried to construct uh, uh, end run around that that would have made it a little bit easier for them to vote and also would have allowed for curbside voting. Again, 5-4, no explanation. Uh, the Supreme Court bats it away. Same in Texas. Uh, I will end with Justice Sotomayor's dissent in one of uh, the cases where she says, uh, the court's inaction continues a trend of condoning disenfranchisement and what she worries about, I think what we all worry about is that the principle the court continues to lean on, which is the so-called Purcell principle, it's from a 2006 case, Purcell versus Gonzalez, that says we don't change the status quo before an election, is being used as a way of saying we're not gonna change the status quo by allowing it to be easier for folks to vote and that has to be antithetical in particularly in a moment when people are terrified to vote in a pandemic. We know what happened to Wisconsin voters in the primary who stood in line during a pandemic to vote and also knowing that the postal services seem to be slowing. So all of these issues, I think, kind of clump into the bucket of stuff to be worried about going into a hotly contested election, which may be facing a second wave of COVID. And I think on this issue, it's fairly clear there's a 5-4 split at the court about how to analyze those cases. Thank you so much, Dahlia. And thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, let's use our remaining time to address some of the many questions that we've received. Uh, a particularly popular question has been regarding expanding the court, which is something that Dahlia already referenced. Uh, there have been many variations of it, but in some, you know, what are the chances that if there's a change in administration, um, 
you know, what would be the implications of such a change? What would expanding or the court would look like? Uh, or if there were term limits, what would that look like? So if some or all of you would like to briefly comment on that, if you could, that would be great. Well, the silence. Um, I think at this point, it's unlikely that the court would be expanded. But if God forbid something happens to one of the justices between now and say January 3rd, and President Trump picks a replacement and that the Senate quickly confirms the individual, then I think there will be court expansion. I think the Democrats regard what happened with regard to Chief Judge Merrick Garland as a stolen seat. And if the Republicans be so hypocritical as to confirm somebody in the election year, I think the response will be that the Democrats would increase the size of the Supreme Court to 13. Just increasing it to 11 leaves a conservative majority, I think would be to 13. But absent something like that, I don't think there'd be sufficient <clears throat> political will to expand the size of the court. And term limits may be favored by a lot of people, but it would require a constitutional amendment. So that makes it unlikely. Anyone else? There, there is one theory about that one uh, obviously, uh, the Constitution gives life tenure to justices, uh, but there's a theory that uh, you could have a term as a justice without having your compensation affected in any way, because that's also constitutionally protected. One could be, as it were, rolled off to become a, a, uh, a circuit judge um, who, uh, as a former justice, much as the way that Justice Souter, for example, often sits by designation um, on the First Circuit. Um, there, there are questions about the legality of that, but that's a possible um, alternative with term limits happening. But I think what you're seeing is a reaction uh, from many quarters to a system now of young appointees who are expected to serve for many, many, many years and the probability that some presidents will have uh, one term and never appoint anybody or even two terms and not be able to appoint in a, in a way that just seems inconsistent with what, with what the original uh, process was. Uh, the only other thing I'll, I'll add to the question uh, about term uh, size of the court being expanded, it's interesting to see the very beginnings of discussions among Republicans in the Senate uh, that perhaps confirming a justice between now and the uh, the end of this term would not be a good idea. Senator Mikowski from, uh, from Alaska interestingly said, I voted in 2016 uh, to, or 2016 and 20, uh, I agreed in 2016 not to confirm uh, Merrick Garland. I, in 2017, uh, voted for Justice Gorsuch. I did that on the condition that that made sense. It makes sense. If it made sense then, it makes sense now. Um, it'll be, that's a trial balloon. And I have not seen uh, a dozen of her colleagues line up behind her. Um, so I think this one's got a ways to go. And of course, the real answer to all this is that uh, Justice Ginsburg should live and be well. Uh, and then it's not an issue between now and January of 20th regardless of who wins in November. Knock wood. Uh, Dahlia, your thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, I, I do think that we, we haven't spent probably nearly enough time on you know, Chief Justice John Roberts, the most fascinating man in America. Um, secondarily, I think Paul is right that Neil Gorsuch is the second most fascinating man in America after this term. But I, I think that John Roberts was so exquisitely careful this term to make sure that we did not have a raft of 5-4 win losses. Uh, and as a consequence, you got some cases like June Medical, like uh, the financial documents cases that Fred described that nobody quite knows what the holding is. Uh, in some sense, they're just pause cases uh, or run out the clock cases, but as a, an effort to take the U.S. Supreme Court off the front pages this summer. It was a really masterful effort. I think, again, that's part of why we're seeing leaks in July, because it's an effort to make the court a salient election issue uh, again. But it seems to me that all of these conversations about court packing, uh, about term limits, about plans that would rotate justices in and out have really, really been dampened, I think, in the last few weeks because John Roberts made it go away. Paul, your thoughts? So, you know, I would just say it's, it is fascinating to watch. I mean, I would have thought four years ago, six years ago, eight years ago, that, you know, the one thing that would plainly be out of bounds 
uh, was another another run at court packing. And, you know, the fact that it's gone from kind of completely out of bounds to something that, you know, people are asking this many questions about and, you know, is, is certainly being contemplated in some circles. You know, I, I think it, it, it may be, in my view, kind of reflects the, the fact that, you know, the, the, the confluence of events that we have in the Supreme Court and part of what makes it so worth watching and why we have thousands of viewers right now is, you know, you do have the court deciding some of the most central issues uh, that the country faces. And I think, you know, to have sort of nine life tenured people deciding some of the most kind of politically charged issues in the country um, is, you know, not a particularly stable isotope in my view. I mean, I don't know that, you know, the framers really thought that when they were creating the Supreme Court, that the court and the kind of people who would be justices would be deciding issues that are this central on, on, on just issue after issue. And if you have that dynamic, I, I think it's only natural that you know, the, the political system will start considering you know, what, are, what are the options to get kind of more political accountability to the people who are deciding these absolutely central issues. And, and at least in my mind, that's part of why something like court packing goes from a pretty fringe idea to something that's discussed more seriously in just a couple of years. Thank you. I think we can squeeze in one last question uh, and hopefully with a quick answer. Um, I'd like to ask, let's ask Erwin about the impact that Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kavanaugh have had on the court because both of them have really developed distinct voices. Justice Sotomayor, she's consistently maintained that the court's rulings should consider and reflect people's lived experiences. Uh, and Justice Kavanaugh has just completed his first full term. So how have their voices started to influence the other justices and how have they really made themselves known on the court? We know much more about Justice Sotomayor after a decade than we know after Justice Kavanaugh after less than two terms. I think Justice Sotomayor is a very important voice on the court. She's not only one of the most liberal justices on the court, she's also a person of color. Many justices, including Senator Connor, said that they were tremendously influenced by hearing from Thurgood Marshall about his life experiences. I think for Sonia Sotomayor to often speak as a woman of color and what that means is important. Like Thurgood Marshall, she wanted the court to really focus on what would be the effect of the Supreme Court's decisions on people's lives, especially those in marginalized communities. For Brett Kavanaugh, it's much harder to say what his voice is. I want to go to something that Paul pointed out, that in the Bostock case about Title VII, Justice Alito wrote a vehement, vitriolic dissent joined by Justice Thomas, but Justice Kavanaugh dissented, but wrote separately to want to have a somewhat softer voice and be more cognizant of the rights of gay, lesbian, and transgender individuals. I think what we're going to likely see from Justice Kavanaugh is he's going to be a conservative justice, but want to separate himself from the more extreme conservatives, just Thomas and Alito. Thank you so much, Erwin. Although I could happily spend the rest of the day discussing these cases and the court, we are unfortunately out of time and we have to wrap up. Thank you again to our esteemed panelists for sharing your time and your knowledge with us and to the National Constitution Center for co-sponsoring the program. I do hope that we'll be able to debrief safely in person next summer at our next Supreme Court review. And thank you all so much. Take care, have a good day, everyone stay safe.